Welcome, and thank you for uh, joining us for today's event, uh, hosted by Foundation for Defense of Democracies, FDD. It's Thursday, October 26th, and today's panel will discuss the Republic of Turkey's trajectory and viability as a geopolitical and security partner at the 100-year mark of the establishment of the state. I'm Jonathan Shanzer, FDD's Senior Vice President for Research. We're pleased to have you here for this conversation, some in person, some tuning in live, and some listening on your favorite podcast platform. I want to say first and foremost that we congratulate the people of Turkey on this important milestone. That said, FDD, as many of you know, has a track record now of chronicling a very dangerous turn that we have observed in Turkey over the last decade or two. This wrong turn can be described in a number of ways, and I'm going to uh, list some of them here today. Um, we have noted since 2011 that Turkey has uh, fully embraced the terrorist group Hamas based out of the Gaza Strip. There is a headquarters that operates in Istanbul. There are military operatives that run around in the country. There are fundraisers. There are political operatives. Uh, all manner of uh, Hamas operatives continue to roam free in Turkey despite sanctions, despite the group's violent record, and for some reason, the government in Ankara has refused to change its policy. But it doesn't end there. FDD has been involved for quite some time in tracking the illicit finance that has flowed through Turkey. Uh, and between 2012 to 2015, FDD was at the forefront of researching what was known as the Gas for Gold scheme. This was a scheme facilitated by the Turkish government to help Iran evade sanctions to the tune of $20 billion. This was the largest sanctions evasion scheme in modern history, and it was designed to help the Islamic Republic evade sanctions right at the moment where the discussions between the United States and the Islamic Republic were their most sensitive. Where pressure should have been brought to bear, Turkey opened up the valve and allowed for massive funds to flow, and we have not yet seen the, uh, the Turkish state pay a price. It doesn't even end there. Between 2012 and roughly 2017, we saw a massive influx of fighters joining the Islamic State in Syria, passing through Turkey's borders. There was a time where some of my colleagues here at FTD, we met with a, uh, let's just say, a, a US official who had recently left the region and we asked him if he had discussed this matter with Turkish officials. And he openly stated to me that the MIT, Turkish intelligence, was of course aware of this influx of fighters and that Turkish officials said that this would be something that after the Assad regime fell, that it would be able to take care of the problem. Of course, we know what happened as a result of Turkey's disastrous policies. We saw the rise of the Islamic State and its violence rack the region, and in many ways, I think it is yet to recover. By the way, we can also note with certainty that the Islamic State was using Turkey as a jurisdiction of illicit finance transfer all throughout this process. It doesn't even end there. 2019, we saw the Turks acquire the S-400 system from Russia. This was in defiance of American policy. It continues to be a major problem, and it is something that I think truly undermines the argument that we need Turkey as a bulwark against Islamic extremism to the east and as a bulwark against the Russians as well. Everything that we have seen over the last decade and a half has undermined this argument time and again. And now we see a Turkish government utterly defiant in the wake of the 10-7 massacre. Some people are calling it a pogrom. 1,400 people killed in southern Israel while Hamas remains active in Istanbul. 
and the government of Turkey continues to defend its actions. Erdogan himself continues to talk about the group as a legitimate resistance movement. Unbelievable from an American ally. So what now? I think we are likely to see sanctions handed down by the U.S. government against entities that are operating inside Turkey. There is a full mobilization of the U.S. government in this regard. But I don't think that it will end there. There will need to be serious discussions about the removal of that Hamas office in Istanbul. There will need to be discussions about maritime smuggling. In fact, only a few weeks before the war erupted in the Middle East, we were all made aware of a news item revealing that uh, there was a shipment, supposedly, of building materials that was sent from Turkey to, the, to Hamas or to the Gaza Strip. Inside that shipment of building materials was, in fact, tons of explosive materials. There are questions now about whether Turkey knew in advance of what was to come and whether this was in preparation for the rockets that Hamas would want to build. We will need to talk about diplomatic passports that Hamas has been reportedly using as it travels in and out of Turkey. And I think, finally, there will need to be a discussion, perhaps, about creating the mechanism, finally, for the ejection of NATO allies that are not acting like allies. These are all tough questions. These are not easy things for U.S. policy to handle, but I do believe that a policy review is in the offing. These are a few ideas that we can put on the table right now, but what I can tell you is that U.S. policy cannot continue as it has been turning a blind eye to all of this malign activity uh, being conducted by Ankara. This is my framing for today's discussion. Thankfully, we have people here who are far smarter than I am who are going to take it from here. I want to introduce them briefly before handing over the panel to my colleague Eric Edelman. First, I want to welcome Henri Barkey, who is the Bernard L. and Bertha F. Cohen Professor of International Relations at Lehigh University, Chair of the Academic Committee on the Board of Trustees at the American University of Iraq in Sulaymaniyah, and Adjunct Senior Fellow for Middle East Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. Henri previously served as the State Department Policy Planning Staff, working on the Eastern Med, the Middle East, and intelligence-related issues. Next, we have my colleague Sinan Jidi, an FTD non-resident senior fellow and an expert on Turkish domestic and foreign policy. Sinan is also an associate professor of national security studies at the Marine Corps University. Sinan was the executive director of the Institute of Turkish Studies based at Georgetown University for nine years. Between 2008 and 2011, he established the Turkish Studies Program at the University of Florida's Center for European Studies. Next, we have uh, uh, Sibel Oktay, uh, who is a non-resident senior fellow at Chicago Council on Global Affairs and an associate professor and former director of the School of Politics and International Affairs at the University of Illinois Springfield. Her current project uh, focus on elite and mass attitudes towards alliances, foreign policy fiascos, and how leaders influence coalition decision-making processes. Moderating today's conversation is Ambassador Eric Edelman, former ambassador to the republics of Finland and Turkey in the Clinton and Bush administrations and former principal deputy assistant to the vice president for national security affairs. He now serves as chair of FTD's Turkey program and as advisor to FTD's Center on Military and Political Power, also known as CMPP. He also holds uh, ver uh, uh, positions at the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments, at the Philip Mer Merrill School for Strategic Studies at Johns Hopkins University at SICE, and the Miller Center of Public Affairs at the University of Virginia. That's a lot of hats, Eric. Um, before we dive in, uh, just a few final words about FDD. For more than 20 years, we have operated as a fiercely independent, nonpartisan research institute exclusively focused on national security and foreign policy. I I should just note here that we have been so independent that we have produced pieces on Turkey, monographs in the past where people were denying much of what we were saying for a number of years. And we can now say with pride that both of these and a lot of our other products still stand. They still hold up today. We certainly recommend that you check out our website. You can look on the Turkey program and you can find some of these products that we've put out. As a point of pride and principle, we do not accept foreign government funding. Since the attacks uh, on Israel on October 7th, 
Uh, FDD experts have produced more than 600 broadcast, print, and radio appearances and original research publications. To stay up to date on our real-time analysis, I encourage you to check back regularly on our website, which is fdd.org, and follow us on Twitter or the platform now known as X. Uh, we are at FDD. That's enough from me. Ambassador, take it away. Uh, thank you, John. Thank you for that introduction, and thank you to FDD for hosting uh, this event today. I'm thrilled to be on this panel with Sibel and uh, Sinan and, and Henri. Um, let me just make a, a couple of uh, opening observations before we dive into this, since we're marking the 100th anniversary of the Turkish Republic. Um, when I was ambassador, uh, you know, I used to note to my embassy staff that um, Dean Acheson in 1947, at the time of the Truman Doctrine speech, uh, and when the bill for aid to Greece and Turkey was before the United States Congress, testified in closed session, not in public, that Turkey was a, as he put it, imperfect democracy. Um, and my own view was that uh, as an embassy, it was our job to help Turkey perfect its democracy. And I had in mind a comment that Lord Kinross made in his biography of, of Ataturk, which was that Ataturk had uh, committed a, uh, a very liberal act, a, had a liberal end, which he accomplished by very illiberal means, uh, which was to set the country on the path of democracy and westernization. But uh, when he died, uh, unfortunately, um, at a relatively early age, it's actually pretty amazing what he accomplished uh, in that short span of time, he left a lot of questions unanswered, uh, in, in particular the role of religion in society, the role of the military in politics, uh, the role of the state in the economy, and the role of ethnicity in the nation. Um, and uh, Turkey has been working through those issues uh, since he passed from the scene and uh, since his successor, Ismet Inanu, uh, launched Turkey on the path of uh, a multi-party democracy in 1950. I don't think we should look back on the relationship, you know, sort of with rose-colored glasses. There were plenty of ups and downs in the U.S.-Turkish relationship during the Cold War. Uh, we had the, uh, there was a not, in, you know, um, inconsiderable kerfluffle over the withdrawal of the uh, Jupiter missiles from Turkey as a consequence of the end of the Cuban missile crisis. Um, a few years later, uh, we had the Johnson letter uh, over one of the periodic crises over uh, Cyprus that rocked the relationship. And there were certainly tensions during um, the US war in Vietnam. But throughout all of that, Turkey remained essentially a stalwart ally in NATO um, in the larger Cold War with the Soviet Union. And for those of us who consider themselves friends of Turkey, I think what's been uh, dispiriting and uh, concerning has been uh, in, in more recent years, uh, as John said in his introductory comments, a turn uh, towards a much more authoritarian kind of politics uh, domestically, which has been accompanied by a rise of uh, anti-Western uh, rhetoric uh, not just limited by, I'm sorry to say, to the ruling party, the AKP, but shared broadly uh, in the opposition. Um, and a pattern that John talked about of uh, Turkey collaborating uh, with Hamas, offering uh, Hamas leaders a home in Istanbul, uh, as well as other kinds of uh, aid and comfort. And that issue, I think, has taken on, obviously, a new dimension since October 7th and the horrific uh, atrocities that Hamas uh, committed in Israel and uh, the taking of hostages as well. In addition, we've seen a pattern of hedging uh, between Russia and uh, NATO that um, is, is equally troubling. Uh, John mentioned the uh, purchase of the S-400s, uh, but there are other instances one could cite as, as well. And so I think we're, we're sitting uh, at a interesting point in time where a lot of the traditional verities about the U.S.-Turkish uh, relationship are being questioned, I think for good reason, and I hope we'll dig into those uh, today. 
So, uh, Sinan, um, let me start uh, with you, and let me start with uh, the, the issue of uh, Hamas leaders, because you've written several pieces in the last couple of weeks about um, Turkey's uh, relations with uh, Hamas and uh, their and the question of whether or not they're willing to to break these ties now in the light of what happened. I think I think we know the answer now, but I, I think. Um, President Erdogan has kind of given us a dispositive answer in his comments in the last couple of days. But just going back in time, we had not only uh, meetings with Hamas leaders in, um, in Istanbul and Ankara, we had the Mavi Marmara flotilla, which led to a, a crisis in, in uh, Turkish-Israeli relations. Uh, in the current instance, we see uh, Turkey, you know, you know, trailing along but behind Qatar, uh, trying to insert itself in the negotiations over hostage relief. And those comments that I mentioned of President Erdogan uh, glorifying, I would say, Hamas, uh, calling them a liberation movement, uh, and criticizing not just the Israeli response, but the U.S. support for the Israeli response, are arguing that it's a form of mental illness. Um, what uh, can be done to get the Erdogan regime to focus on the damage it's doing to itself in the United States uh, by maintaining these ties with Hamas? And is there any chance that we can get uh, Turkey to take a, a slightly more nuanced view of this issue? Uh, thank you, Eric, and thank you all for coming. Um, I think it might be useful just to sort of initially begin answering your question, Eric, by suggesting that um, that hope that Turkey might take a more nuanced and more measured position in this conflict is, is fast dissipating. Um, for all those unaware, on Saturday there is something called the, uh, the, the Great Palestine Meeting that will take place in Istanbul's closed Atatürk airport that will be headlined by Erdogan, and which is likely to be what I would call the sort of a jubilation of pro-Hamas propaganda. So please tune into that if, you haven't, if you're not already sort of aware of this in terms of just sort of seeing where the Turkish government is on this level. Um, I also woke up to an image this morning of a bookshop in Beyazet, uh, a, a, a relatively conservative district of Istanbul where outside a sign was hung saying, Jews are not allowed in. Um, and that is more representative, I think, of the position of public opinion, which I think has been radicalized by this government's sort of elite manipulation of anti-Semitic and anti-Jewish um, and anti-Israeli sentiments over the last number of years. And I would just also like to say, you know, FTD has been very pronounced and clear on this for a number of years, suggesting that expecting Turkey to mediate or essentially have a more nuanced position of the Arab-Israeli conflict um, has not been something that we said is going to happen. And we've been very consistent in that. And we, I, I take no pleasure in essentially saying, look, you know, we told you so. Uh, but this morning, I also saw from um, the Jewish Insider saying the, the conference of presidents of major American, American Jewish organizations called Erdogan a charlatan for referring to um, Hamas as a group of Mujahideen fighting for the liberation of Palestine. And this was also representative of the attempt, or the sort of well-intentioned attempt, to think that Turkey and Israel could rebuild substantive ties. Um, I think that has been a mistake, uh, but hopefully in the coming days and weeks you will see more research produced by FDD which specifically highlights some of the more individual connections, the network of Hamas leaders, their enablers and their supporters in places like the Turkish parliament, uh, and the entrenched financial networks that continue to exist to this day. So um, you could look at this in two ways. There is a historical precedent which I think needs to be established here. Um, that, first, that, that, that first precedent is Erdogan's own mindset. Right? I remember going back to the days of the 2010s, the early 2010s, when Erdogan really sort of started to ruin the bilateral relationship between Israel and Turkey. And people started asking what changed in Erdogan, given that he is, was supposed to be this pragmatist that was a pro-Western, pro-NATO, pro-European approach to Turkey's foreign policy and situ situating. And my answer to that at that time was nothing. You know, this is Erdogan going back to factory settings. Um, and subsequent engagement and situating of Hamas inside of Turkey over the last decade or more 
has been very institutionalized. Um, at that time, following the Marmi Mavi Marmara incident, what we did see was the, the origins of Hamas being situated in Turkey is following the release of Gilad Shalit, the Israeli um, soldier, in return for which 10 Hamas prisoners were allowed to reside in Turkey. Some of these people are their leaders. Uh, they have essentially um, uh, spent time in prison for the murder of Jewish citizens. Uh, they've done prison time for this. They now live in Turkey uh, as, as citizens, and they basically laid the groundwork for Hamas becoming institutionalized in Turkey. Um, more recently, and this morning, uh, you also saw Ismail Khania, one of the likely masterminds of the 10-7 attacks, uh, thank Foreign Minister Fidan, saying that we just had a wonderful meeting with him today, and he would like to thank uh, uh, Minister Fidan for Turkey's continued support of Hamas. My, com my compatriots often ask me uh, on social media saying, am I not ashamed to be sort of taking such an anti-Turkey position? My position I don't think is anti-Turkey. I am literally ashamed that at the 100th anniversary of what you refer to, and I agree, as an imperfect republic, an imperfect democracy, one founded by, on the principles of uh, Kemal Ataturk's vision, is now shilling for and representing a known terrorist entity with deep financial and military ties. Um, some of these leaders, as John mentioned in his opening remarks, they should not be de-emphasized. People like Ismail Haniya and Salih al-Aruri carry Turkish passports. And that's not insignificant simply because Turkey plays a front and center role in enabling the Hamas attacks that not just occurred in 10-7, in in, in but we can also say that is the means by which Hamas coordinates its international presence in the region. If those leaders cannot travel internationally, how do they coordinate with other powers such as Iran? This is front and center and it should not be de-emphasized. Um, also, and I'll finish on this point because I'm sure that we have much more to say. Um, Erdogan has also, in, just before his vile sort of Mujahideen remark, has also been conducting uh, shuttle diplomacy by telephone with his Iranian counterpart, Raisi, and not just in relevance to uh, the 10-7 attacks, um, suggesting that Turkey and Iran should actually co coordinate on a response to Israel's counterterrorism mission. But this has also been going back throughout this year. In, in, at the, the outbreak of violence in, at the Al-Aqsa Mosque in, in earlier this year, Erdogan again called Raisi, suggesting that they should coordinate a response. So what we are dealing with here is not an, a person or a leadership structure of Turkey that is interested in medi mediating the problem or trying to find a solution. But based on the image of saying, no Jews allowed in bookstores in Turkey this morning, what we're seeing is a person, <coughs> a leadership, which just hates Jews and is anti-Israeli through to the core. And that is a problem that we will continue to address AFDD. Um, let me just uh, pull on uh, a couple of uh, threads, if I uh, could, Sinan, before uh, turning to Sibel. Uh, which is, there have been these reports that the Turkish government asked uh, Ismail Haniya and a few other of the leaders to please decamp <laughs> from Istanbul and uh, to go to Doha. What do you make of that? And then uh, finally, uh, just this morning, uh, you know, uh, the Financial Times reported that uh, the Turkish bourse kind of had a collapse um, uh, as a result of Erdogan's comments. The uh, so-called circuit breakers, I mean, it, it fell 7%. It was falling so rapidly, the circuit breakers were uh, you know, put into place to, to keep this from becoming a complete you know, market route. Yeah. A lot of this is being attributed to the business community's concern that the turn in economic policy um, it was uh, heavily dependent on uh, securing foreign direct investment. Uh, into Turkey and that Erdogan's comments were clearly going to screw that up. Um, is there a chance that sort of economic factors may come into play and uh, modulate some of this? I think if they do, that is up to Erdogan because I think the extremist sort of rhetoric and intent to act against Israel is coming from Erdogan directly. And to that point, what you're seeing on the other hand is Finance Minister Shimshek, who's obviously trying to be in the last few months since the election, since he was appointed, trying to sort of band-aid and patch together Turkey's sort of um, 
plagued economy uh, back to a sensitive, sensible sort of uh, established sort of economic track. But that's that's hamstrung. To to the other point, though, um, it is it has been reported that on October seven, Ismail Haniyeh was reportedly in Turkey, uh, after which time he was asked to politely leave, knowing. Uh, as the news started trickling in of the mass casualties and atrocities that were occurring in southern Israel. Um, and that, that really does underscore a point that, you know, you can ask the question, what is a NATO ally doing hosting a leader who subsequently apparently held a, you know, a celebratory prayer as the news was trickling in of Israelis getting massacred? Um, and, and I don't know how the Turks get ahead of that. But also since then, the, you know, the Turkish government has been on, 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 the, on the horn, right, saying, you know, if you take Erdogan's tweets or the official communiques of the foreign ministry highlighting what Erdogan's saying, he's trying to highlight, you know, what he calls gross human rights violations, whereas the UN Convention on Human Rights Against Palestinians, there's massacres taking place, et cetera, et cetera, whilst at the same time, obviously, the Turkish military has been engaged in gross atrocities in northeastern Syria by bombing not only uh, northern, north, north Syrian type, but specifically civilian inst installations such as hospitals, health care centers, as well as schools, apparently. Um, over 400 rocket strikes by Turkish artillery and military have been recorded in northeastern Syria since 10 7. And some uh, close calls with U.S. forces. Absolutely, yes. Um, and, and we've also just forgotten the, the notion that the United States shot down a Turkish drone for appearing to be too threatening against the positioning of U.S. forces, which, you know, it, it by itself should probably be an event-turning sort of uh, thing, but, we, you know, it's gotten lost in translation, unfortunately. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of news going on, more than, more than I think we can consume. Um, Sibel Oktay, um, the <coughs> Turkish social contract seems to be under enormous stress. Turkey, like other... Um, States, I and mean, we should in the United States be, uh, I think, mindful of the fact we have our own divisions. But Turkey is deeply divided mm -hmm. society mm -hmm. uh, across a variety of different axes, um, and each camp Kurds, Islamists, uh, nationalists, Kemalists uh, very suspicious of, of the others. Um, what impact do these d deep divisions? Uh, in Turkey have on Turkey's international standing. And to follow up a little bit on uh, some of the comments that uh, Sinan made, how deeply rooted do you mm -hmm. think this, you know, anti-Semitism uh, that leading AK party figures have expressed since October 7th <laughs> is in Turkey? You know, I'm, I'm mindful of the fact that there was a Ottoman <laughs> tradition of somewhat greater um, sensitivity to, you know, minority, mm -hmm. you know, rights. Um, uh, but I did see, while I was ambassador at the beginning, during the early years of the AK Party's rule, uh, proliferation of anti-Semitic literature, publication of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion in multiple editions, Mein Kampf appearing in bookstores, etc. So this has been a 20-year sort of ongoing um, you know, sort of ideological poisoning, I think, starting at the top. How deeply rooted do you think it is? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me. Good morning, everyone. Um, I, I want to start by saying how um, fully I agree with the, the characterization that Sinan made of, of this really interesting moment that we are talking about Turkey's involvement with Hamas. Uh, on Turkey's centennial. Um, and I, I, I share the emotions that you, you just described. I could not have described them better. And before I talk about you know, the social contract and these very timely questions that you're posing, um, Ambassador, I want to also continue pulling on those threads that, that we, we, we just sort of started fraying. Um, the, the fact that the, um, the stock exchange, Istanbul Stock Exchange, uh, basically skydove, right, um, by seven points uh, this, uh, this today, it's happening at the same time on the same day that the Turkish Central Bank increased interest rates, right? That's the fifth consecutive um, hike in interest rates um, that should have been uh, received uh, positively by, um, by, the, by, by foreign investors, by um, um, uh, by economists, but then you're seeing that the, the stock exchange is not responding in the same way that we would have otherwise expected given this, this um, interest rate hike. 
And so that just goes to show how deeply entrenched the political situation um, is in Turkey and how uh, directly it impacts the economy of, of, the, of the country. And so a lot of it is, is the government's own doing. And, it's, um, and no matter how, um, uh, no matter these reforms, no matter how much Mehmet Şimşek, the finance minister, and Hafizegay Erkan uh, the, the, the governor of the central bank want to, and their team, um, want to improve uh, the state of the economy through these, you know, gradual rate hikes. Um, the way in which the government um, uh, talks about the, the current um, um, crisis in, in Israel goes to show that it's not just about economic governing, right? It's also about um, how you um, conduct politics and foreign policy. Mm -hmm. So I, I wanted to um, bring your attention to that. So um, let me start by the anti-Semitism question uh, going, uh, following from, from what Sinan, Sinan said. <coughs> and I, again, I agree with, with his comments. Um, I think anti-Semitism, as far as the AKP and Erdogan himself is concerned, it's baked into their DNA. Um, it's baked into um, his, um, uh, his profile as a politician in Turkey. Now, let's remember that he was a protege of Nejmettin Erbakan, right? The modern sort of founding father of political Islam in Turkey. And I remember um, when I was a kid and growing up in Turkey, and I, I used to watch the news a lot and look where I am now. And, um, and, and every other word that, that Nejmetin Erdogan would say, uh, Nejmetin Erbakan would say at, on, on TV and, um, uh, and, and you know, on, the, on, on, on his stump speeches was all about Zionism, right? Zionists, 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 Zionists are there, Zionists are there. And so he, he was vilifying um, uh, Zionism, but also specifically speaking the Jews at every instance he could get. Now, Erdogan's political coming of age happened at the same time that this rhetoric was, was prevalent in Turkish society. Uh, and so it is, I mean, the apple cannot fall far from the tree, right? So in this sense, I think um, understanding Erdogan has to start with understanding the political context and the, and the, the political context in which he grew up and he became a politician in, and also the people he rubbed shoulders and elbows all through his political career. The second thing is, and this was something that used to come up a lot, I, don't, I haven't seen uh, this particular anecdote come up um, more recently, but back in the 1970s, when he was, I think, around 20, 22 years old, he wrote, uh, directed, and starred in this um, play called Maskom Yah, which is this um, sort of abbreviation for Masons, Communists, and Jews. It's basically an anti-Semitic trope um, uh, that includes, <clears throat> you know, all the uh, sort of the, all the cliches and the stereotypes that you can imagine. Um, and, and he was proud. And, and this came up a, a number of times in his interviews, especially when he was an up and coming sort of national level politician and, um, and people were interested in his sort of political background and ideological leanings. And, and this used to come quite a bit. And so now when uh, you know, it, when he says Hamas is uh, a liberator group, they are the Mujahideen, and, and he, it's, it's not even blanket support anymore, or blanketed support anymore, it's, it's basically outright support of, of what, what this uh, terrorist group stands for. I think we should go back and, and realize that this was his factory setting all along. This is, the, um, this is the mindset that he grew up in, that he practiced, and, and um, uh, and now he's conducting his politics. And so I think that's something that we should be cognizant of. And going back to these debates about whether Turkey can mediate this crisis, absolutely not. I mean, I, I hope I get to, get to be proven wrong, um, uh, but I really don't think that Turkey is in a position to mediate this crisis, and, and certainly Erdogan is not. Uh, and this is not even the first time that Turkey dropped the ball on this, right? So prior to Operation Cast Lead, um, around the, the um, around 2003, 2004, when he recently had become president at the time, uh, prime minister at the time, he was very interested in negotiating uh, um, or sort of mediating the Arab-Israeli conflict. Um, he both wanted to pursue a Syrian-Israel track. He also wanted to pursue a Palestinian-Israeli track, um, but. 
uh, again, this sort of DNA that he cannot, or this sort of reflex that he cannot control comes, uh, comes to the fore. And, and as soon as the Operation Cast Lead started, he sort of did a, a swift 180, um, and then the rest is history, right? The, the Davos walkout in, 2010, uh, in 2009 against Shimon Peres, uh, the, the very man who negotiated uh, the only uh, viable peace agreement that r remains in, in history books, right? The Oslo Accords and the israeli Jordanian Peace Treaty uh, and all that. And so, and then Mavi Marmara is, of course, another, another episode. So given all this thick history uh, uh, um, between Turkey under Erdogan and, and Israel, I really don't think uh, mediation is uh, in the cards for, for them. Now, going back to this question of social contract, again, very important, very timely question, considering uh, this specific moment where um, Turkey is celebrating its centennial. I, and without going all sort of professorial on you or anything, um, let's talk about what a social contract means to begin with, right? So um, Ernest Renan, um, famous French historian, uh, talks about how nation is a daily plebiscite, right? It's a very sort of civic understanding of a nation. It's not about your um, ethnic heritage. It's not about the blood that's in your veins. It's really about having this kind of um, daily uh, pledge of solidarity with people who you might have never met in your life, but you celebrate the, the same things and you mourn over the same things. And, and I think when we talk about social contract in Turkey, um, this idea of being a nation uh, in, a, in a civic sense, right? Celebrating and mourning together uh, is really no longer there, right? Yeah. And, and, and social contract, I understand social contract to be undergirded by this idea of a nation. And I think it's really sort of shattered. It has shattered before our eyes. Um, Turkey, when, I, when, when we talk about social contract or when I think about social contract, I'm thinking of not just celebrating and mourning together, but also um, uh, having ties of trust, having ties of love, right? Um, th th this sounds kind of fluffy, but you know, it's, it, it really is what makes a nation hold together. It means competing in good faith, right? We will compete in politics, we will compete in economics and, and social life, but as long as people do it in good faith, that means if you lose today, you might win tomorrow, and if you lose today, that doesn't mean the end of your life and livelihood as you know it. That has been completely shattered in Turkey. Now, you might argue that there are reasons for it, reasons some of which are not in the, in the people's own making, such as the horrific governance of the economy, um, and, and people are, are in deep economic crisis um, everywhere in the world, uh, in, in, the, in the country but also um, you know, unprecedented levels of corruption and nepotism that, that, um, uh, that, that depreciates trust in institutions, which I, I hope we get to talk about. Um, but also this is, this is the government's own making, right? If you, if you constantly vilify 50% of your society, of your population as enemies number one, then that obviously starts to fray and, and stretch and, and ultimately tear this, uh, this social fabric apart. Now, I, I, I'm really glad that you brought up uh, the, um, the October 28th demonstration on Greater Palestine. What's really striking to me, what's remarkable to me, that this is happening the day before October 29th, that's the centennial of the republic. And so that just goes to show where President Erdogan and, and, and where, his, um, where his heart lies, it seems. Uh, and that is, I guess, the sort of um, a final data point. Uh, I should say a last but not least, you know, um, a data point on, on where, what, how we should think about Turkish society and, and Turkish social fabric and the contract going forward. So, Bill, I want to pull on, uh, you want to talk about nepotism and corruption. I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that right now. Sure. Um, Turkey has municipal elections coming up, mm -hmm. uh, uh, beginning of, uh, well, spring of next year. Mm -hmm. um, in the last round, um, AKP lost control of Ankara, Istanbul, mm -hmm. other major uh, metropolises. In fact, I think they lost control of, I think uh, 
uh, urban areas that produce about 70% of the nation's wealth. Mm -hmm. He obviously uh, wants to take those back. I mean, he tried to keep uh, Ekrem Emimoglu from actually sure. serving as mayor yeah. of Istanbul, failed. Uh, but he wants to take them back. And mm -hmm. one of the reasons he wants to take them back is because of the potential for, uh, for peculation and, and corruption. Right. Do you think that, um, I mean, is he crazy like a fox? Is all of this anti-Semitism and pro-Hamas stuff actually helping him mobilize his base for the elections uh, next spring? And, and uh, is he following, in, a, in essence, a, uh, a strategy of, of polar, a, a positive strategy of polarization? He mm -hmm. wants to polarize society in order to drive out his, you know, drive up his vote total. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess it's too, too soon to tell whether this will impact or, or his take on Hamas uh, and, and his positioning about, about that, how that will affect elections. But if there's one thing I guess we all know about Erdogan is that everything is about the next election, right? Everything is about survival. Everything is about um, whether he, he's going to be able to expand the AKP's uh, strongholds and, and recapture Istanbul, Ankara, and Izmir, these major economic powerhouses, including the, the, the capital of the country. And so um, I don't know how this, this particular moment will play out in the elections, but certainly that's something that he's after. Um, and, uh, and I guess we can also talk about this more in the Q&A, but one thing that really um, separates Turkish politics, uh, and I guess when you compare Turkish politics to U.S. politics and, and electoral politics, is how here it's all about turnout and, and who you can bring out to the polls. Turkey has historically had very high turnout rates, but I think for this local election, I think a lot of it will come down to whether the, the opposition can bring out um, its supporters out to the polls um, and, and who's going to turn out their own base. So, um, so this might implicate, um, but I think it's too soon to tell. Last but definitely not least, Henri. Oh, Sinan, do you want to say something? A couple something of brief before? comments. I know I'm monopolized, but it's just, sure. otherwise I'll forget. Um, at the centenary of the Republic, um, I, I agree with Sibab, we should be at this point celebrating the diversity of Turkey over the, over the last century. You know, we have approximately 25% of the population which is Kurdish of origin. Turkey's largest remaining non-Muslim non minority are the, Tur Ju uh, the Jewish population. I, I, would, I, I would really care to think or ask how they are feeling right now, given what's about to take place on Saturday and these mass vitriolic rallies. Um, when she's, when Sibel really nailed the notion of this is Erdogan down to his core, I mean, there, there should be no doubt about this. I mean, you have a man that is fixated on completely tearing down Turkey's um, res, you know, existing relationship with Israel, one which he broke and he was supposedly trying to put back together in the last 10 day, a, a year or so, which has completely, I think, been abandoned. But also in this notion of, you know, is it just electorally determined and is it just you know, to, to woo voters with this sort of vile anti, you know, Kurds are terrorists, Jews are you know, murderers, right? Whatever he, he calls them. It should also be known that in the Turkish parliament, my, my colleagues, Melissa Sachs and Joe Trusman of FDD have, have really nailed this um, and will be working on this more, uh, more in the coming future. We'll, we'll sing, also identify members of the Turkish parliament who are AKP members who not clandestinely, but quite openly associate and host Hamas meetings, their leaders, as well as, uh, uh, as their philanthropists, quote unquote, within Turkey. And they put those up in their social media accounts. And this is publicly available information. It's not that this is being sort of you know, hidden. So even if it is sort of electioneering in one mode, on the other hand, the, the fact that you have parliamentarians openly you know, you know, spurring on and cheering for Hamas is exist institutional existence in Turkey is deeply entrenched. Sorry. All right, as I was saying, uh, last but definitely not least, uh, you've spent a lot of time uh, both in the academy but also in government uh, working on the U.S.-Turkish uh, relationship. Um, in every previous era when we had ups and downs, you have looked for pathways to put the relationship on a more solid footing and to maintain a kind of strategic, what we used to call back in the late 90s, a strategic partnership. I don't think we've called it that more recently. Hard to describe it that way. 
you just recently wrote in Foreign Affairs about trying to break the impasse between Ankara and, and Washington. Can you talk about how you think that uh, can be done? And is there some utility in posing the question of, you know, of who lost Turkey? Not that Turkey was ever ours to begin with, but the, we seem to have lost the thread in terms of U.S.-Turkish policy. So is there something to be said about looking back retrospectively that gives us some guidance for how we might change things and put things on a more positive um, basis? Again, let me thank the organizers for inviting me. Um, it's good to be here. It's an, not a good time, though. But in any case, um, look, the Turkish-American relationship and Turkey's position in the world has changed quite a bit. And it has to do, essentially, a lot with Erdogan. But you can argue that Turkey was changing in the sense that as it became a, a more prosperous, more dynamic, uh, especially economy, I mean, think of the Turgutuzal days, uh, that Turkey was actually already changing. And Turgutuzal was the harbinger in many ways of, of that change. But except that his vision of the change was different than Erdogan's. Um, Turkey has always been part of the West, but in a very rather timid way. It ne really never cared about the Middle East that much. The Middle East was a p part of the world it was not really interested in. Um, and even if you look uh, today in terms of Turkey's economic relationships, it's all with the West. I mean, six countries, United States and European countries, account for uh, more than 45, almost 45 percent of Turkish exports. Uh, four countries, I think, in, in the West account for almost 70 percent of investments in Turkey. And when you look at the relationship between Turkey and the Middle East economically, it's not that significant. Yes, there's, especially with Iraq now, there's a lot, but it's not a deep relationship. I mean, Turkish business folks, and this is why maybe the, uh, the, the, the stock market in Turkey is collapsing, is really embedded uh, in, in the West. And, what Özal was trying to do was actually deepen that relationship, but use it also to expand elsewhere, but use the West as its, uh, shall we say, as its anchor. Now, Erdogan is different. Erdogan is different in, in many respects. Look, he has done a lot to change Turkey, and, and let's face it, in the 20 years that he's been the president of Turkey, uh, Turkey has changed quite a bit. I mean, economically, it's far more... Uh, it has expanded, I mean, again, on, on Uzal's footsteps, if you want. But he also decided that he wanted to expand Turkish relationships with other parts of the world. But fundamentally, right, here you have a populist authoritarian leader. And if you look at populist authoritarians uh, around the world, I mean, they do two things. A, they have very expansive views of their own societies, their own countries, but also of themselves, right? And Erdogan, especially after 2007, 2010, started to reshape Turkey's uh, economic, political, well, shall we say, foreign policy, but in a way in which he saw Turkey becoming a pivotal country in, in the world. He, he made it very, ob I mean, open. I mean, he thinks that Turkey should be a member of the Security Council, as a permanent member of the Security Council. The Security Council has to be changed. He saw himself as a leader of the Muslim world, as Turkey being the most, uh, shall we say, dynamic and important Muslim country, a country that's part of NATO and yet um, economically very powerful. Um, but in all of this, it's, there is this element that he actually sees himself as a, as a global leader. What's interesting, of course, is that Turkey is a member of NATO, and Erdogan has decided to challenge what he sees as American hegemony uh, in, in the world. And so, what, yes, the United States has uh, other, shall we say, um, competitors. I mean, you can think of Putin and Xi as, as, as leaders who are challenging the United States. But this is what's interesting about Erdogan, of course, is that he is a challenger that comes in from inside the Western alliance, right? So, and 
clearly, the U.S. government hasn't figured out how to, to deal with them, in part because, yes, Turkey is very, very important. Look at geography. I mean, it is probably um, uh, geographically, geopolitically, I should say, one of the most important countries, first or second, in, uh, in, in the world in terms of, I mean, and Eric, you've been in government, so you know uh, better than all of us in that sense. Um, so Turkey has a great asset it can deploy at any point in time uh, in its favor. So Erdogan has been smart about using that. It's too big to fail. It's too big to fail, right. And, and so, so he has challenged the United States from within, within the alliance and we haven't figured out how to, how to, how to deal with, with, with that. And he's gotten away with it, right? I mean, look at, uh, when you look at his, his um, uh, shall we say, rhetoric, right? increasingly he has become anti-American and blames the United States for just about every ill uh, in, in, in the world. Right. Even be, I mean, forget about the Gaza uh, uh, conflict now. Even before Gaza, I mean, the, the, the economic problems that Turkey encounters is America's fault. The uh, the coup in 2016 is America's fault. The, everything that happens in the world is America's fault. Yet he never says the same thing about Russia. Right? Why why doesn't he say the same thing about Russia? I mean, Russia is. Hey, it's is a main major problem for Turkey in many respects, right? Uh, and when you look at Russian, uh, not just in Ukraine but elsewhere, and 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 Russia supporting uh, Assad all these years, and somebody he want uh, Erdogan desperately wanted to overthrow, he doesn't, because he can get away with attacking us because we don't respond. Right. And that has been the main mistake, I think, that the United States has made over the years, that we have essentially allowed him to get away with it. You can argue it's almost maybe there's a, there's a at State or White House and, and, and elsewhere in the U.S. government, oh, you know, Erdogan, he can say whatever he wants. So, you know, we'll let him, we'll let him say what he says. I mean, in other words, not taking him seriously. Yeah. But that was a mistake. It's a mistake in the sense that in Turkey, anti-Americanism was actually owned by the left in the old days. What Erdogan has succeeded in doing is now has made um, uh, anti-Americanism something that both the left and the right own jointly. 70% yep. of the Turkish public think that the United States is the single most important threat to Turkey. Hmm. I mean, how, how, how can you uh, reconcile. reconcile this with the fact that you're a member of NATO, mm -hmm. right? So, but, but here, and I do blame the U.S. government for not essentially standing up to this, because ultimately what we have ended up with is a, now a population in, Tur in Turkey that is very anti-American, right? Paradoxically, when you look at the upper middle class, where is it that they would like to go? It's the Western United States. I mean, you know, the United States is still the most desirable location for, for uh, many Turks. Um, but the only time we have stood up to him was when the S-400 crisis happened, right? The, on the S-400s, uh, to me, what's interesting about the S-400s is that he was told not to buy the S-400s, right? For all the reasons that we know because of the Russians um, and, and co-locating them with the F-35s. He was told that he would lose the F-35. And remember, the F-35 program was such a sweet deal for Turkey. No other country got the same deal. Turkey was going to build part of the F-35s, including the fuselage. Turkey was going to be the location for kind of repairing or maintaining, ma uh, doing the maintenance of mm -hmm. the, the F-35 in, in, in some of the Eastern European countries. It was, it was a huge boon for the, for the Turkish economy, to, uh, technology transfers and stuff like that. And, and he claims that we, want, we didn't want to sell the Patriots, which is not true. 
and he, he said there was not that the United States didn't want to uh, give, do technology transfer on the Patriots. What we're doing all this technology transfer with the F-35? What are you talking about? As if the Russians were going to give him any technology with the S-400s. But it was, uh, and then this is what's to me is interesting. And this is, is I'm going to speculate now. Uh, I don't usually like to do that, but I think that he genuinely believes that the coup in 2016 was organized by us. Uh, just like they think that the coup against uh, Erbakan in 1996 was done by the United States. Um, so the S-400s may have been a system that he was going to put around Ankara, around his palace, or around, should I say, Ankara, because he doesn't trust us. Uh, after the 2016 coup. I don't know. This is, again, a speculation. That's why he went for the S-400s. And this is the only time the U.S. government said no mm -hmm. and stood by it. And I think, I think he assumed that we would say no, 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 and then we would accede because we always do to what he has done in, in, in the past. And, I think and, and there were serious much. costs to saying no. I mean, for the U.S., which is to say the program was slowed down. We had to relocate some of the production facilities right. when we kicked uh, Turkey out of the F-35 right. program. Costly for Lockheed Martin, the manufacturer. Right. I mean, right. there, there were, it was not without cost. Except that we kept the money that the Turks paid for the F-35. So. Right. <laughs> uh, so not, um, not sure it was a even Fair enough. Deal. But, 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 but it was, no, of course it was costly. And... Look, Turkey is a NATO country. We do want the Turks to have the fifth generation aircraft. Now they will not get the fifth generation aircraft, uh, fighter, jet, fighter jets. So it's not, I mean, the way we look at it from a defense perspective, I mean, as a NATO country, especially a frontline NATO country, we want them to have the, uh, the, the, the best uh, equipment. So, but this should have been also a point on which the U.S. government could have uh, built its its new approach to Turkey. I I don't. I think Turkey and the U.S. are allies. They should remain allies. We have to build the relationship into. You know, like ideally, would like it to be like the United States and Italy. I mean, the Italians don't do these things to us, right? Um, the Italians maybe uh, disagree with us on many things, but they don't do this kind of stuff. So. Why is it that the, the administrations, right, when Erdogan says, you did the coup or you are, you are the cause of, the, of our economic problems, don't go around and say, what are you saying? I mean, you need to push back. If you don't push back, Erdogan is going to go through, through, an, through an open door. And I think that's a, that's a, that's a trick, I think, to... to Dealing with him. But again, remember, he's a populist authoritarian, and his ambitions at this stage trump the needs of Turkey and the national interests of Turkey, if you want, as I said, because that they are, um, he, I mean, his own interests uh, are far more important than, than Turkey. And that's not going to change, let's face it. That's not going to change. On, the only thing we can do is maybe contain him, but to do that, we have to expend a great deal of political capital, and I don't see that willingness. Why do you think that is, uh, Henri? I mean, um, and Turkey's a middle power. I mean, this is not like dealing with Russia or China. I mean, it is uh, it is an ally. I mean, uh, I think what you're calling for is, and which, as you know, because we've talked about this incessantly, um, is a more transactional uh, relationship. I mean, we, we've tended to treat Turkey uh, as if it's an ally. Yes, it's sort of misbehaving, but if we treat them like a responsible ally, you know, it will make them respond in kind somehow. And, and that's been repeated over and over again by administrations, as you suggest, without without a positive result. I mean, you know, obviously the, you know, Einstein quote about doing the same thing over <laughs> and over again and expecting a different result comes to mind. So why is it, and, and by the way, uh, you know, uh, I wrote an op-ed in Politico back in 2018 with someone who, co-author who I think should have some influence in the U.S. government, Jake Sullivan, um, in which we argued for 
a more transactional approach, that we can't just say, okay, treat them like an ally. You have to take each issue on its own merits and basically say, okay, what have you done for me lately? If you want X, I will give you Y. Why do you think it's been so hard you know, to get the U.S. Oh, government I, to do that? I completely disagree with the premise of your, of your question. Okay. What we do have now is exactly a transactional relationship. Okay. It's not a relationship of principle. It's not a relationship well, yes. of, of, right? Yes, I agree. It's, 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 we just do business with them. We, we, you know, we want them to, we want bases, we want uh, access to this, or they want this from us. Um, right? So the point is we need to move from a transactional relationship to the a relationship. I mean, we don't have a transactional relationship with, with, with uh, maybe. <laughs> We don't, we don't have a transactional relationship with Italy, right? Right, which is also strategically a very important country given its shape and everything else, right? Um, that's what that should be our goal. But for that, we have to have. We will always have differences with countries. We've had differences sure. with the French all these years. I mean, right. you know, even. But I think the relationship that we have, to, the, 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 what we have today with Erdogan, is help, a, a great deal worse than we had with the goal. And the goal had nuclear weapons. If you, uh, but the the what well, the point here I really want to make is, not we don't want a transactional relationship. A transactional relationship is what we have now, and what we um, we uh, we ending up with this anti-Americanism. Look, the also I, I should I do want to make a sense. I mean, the Israelis also have, have played into what's going on in Turkey. I mean, all the Turk Sea is a bombing of Gaza. And, and that's pretty horrendous. I mean, that's not, uh, so Erdogan can play on that. Uh, I don't think if the Israelis had not thrown a sing, uh, had not bombed it, he would, have, he would have been sympathetic to the Israelis. That's another issue. Um, but anyway, to go back to the, uh, this issue of trend, we, we would like to, we should have a principle relationship and we should tell them what the principles are. You want, it, it, but there is a cost to not. The, let me let me. Be, with a transactional relationship, there are no costs to Turkey. If you want a principled relationship, then you say, "Here is here are the, what we want." The, okay, we know what you want. But you don't you don't behave. You're going to pay a price. They paid a price for the S four hundreds. Today, look at the again to go back to the stock market. Uh, why is the stock market collapsing? Because Turkey needs huge amount of money, and that money is going to come not from the Gulf, mm -hmm. but from the West, mm -hmm. right? And they realize now that that's mo that money is now endangered with In uh, his, yeah. his comments. So there is a cost to Turkey of really antagonizing us, and when they, they may have to go to the IMF for a, for a, for a stabilization program, the United States plays a very big role there. But there's also a cost to the United States, no? And that's the idea that Erdogan operates on. Right. Which is, you know, one of the questions that you asked earlier was about hedging and how, I mean, the question that, that, that you posed to Sinan about how, you know, Turkey is, is playing the sort of politics of hedging in the region. And um, while I agree in principle with what Henri has said, um, that kind of principled slash sort of borderline punitive relationship that the United States might take with Turkey will push Turkey only away from the United States into China, into Russia, and into the, into the Middle East. And so um, is that something that the United States is willing to, you know, um, facilitate? But, I don't know. But, Sibel, look at the relationship that, uh, the economic relationship that Turkey has with China. China buys nothing from Turkey. Mm. Turkey buys a lot of stuff from mm -hmm. China, right? Mm -hmm. What is the relationship with Russia? It's essentially the energy, and now because of the Ukraine war, there's all this other stuff going on. But normally, there's nothing, you know, the Russians buy from Turkey, mm. right? So if, if you're looking at the future of Turkey economically, that future is in Europe and the United States, because those are the markets that, that buy Turkish but goods and the, and the Turkish economy is actually needs those markets. Mm. And Turkey's on the opposite side of any number of regional issues uh, from Russia, whether it's Libya or Syria or Ukraine. 
Um, and yet, Turkey is the only country who was able to talk to both Ukraine and Russia. Listen, right. I'm not trying to defend Turkey, but I'm also right. trying and to I'm show not, that right. like there is a there is a logic to it. Is Italy will never antagonize the United States because Italy does not have a, a hedging strategy. It doesn't it, have an other it can fall back on. It seems that Erdogan and the administration thinks that Turkey does have these others that it can fall back on. Whether that's rightly placed, whether that's, you know, a, a, a sort of a smart thing for Turkey to do. I, I, you know, this goes to the a point of, of perhaps minor disagreement between Henri and me, although I think it may be more taxonomic than anything else, Henri. But, you know, yes, we've been trying to be more transactional with Turkey. We're just not very good at it. Mm. Um, you know, so we've tried to be transactional on the issue of Swedish mm -hmm. um, uh, admission into NATO and ratification of, of the amended uh, NATO treaty uh, and trying to, you know, tie it to the F-16s, even though everybody denies that it's tied to the F-16s, except that's a, you know, we all know that it is. Um, but it, it's, it's still... You know, the administration, I think, is pulling punches because, to Sibel's point, they think Turkey might be useful at some point in negotiations between uh, Russia and Ukraine. They're already, Turkey is the venue right now for ongoing prisoner exchanges and swaps between Russia and Ukraine if we ever get to the point of negotiation over the war in Ukraine, which I'm a little bit doubtful about. But if we ever did, Turkey might be you know, the party that could do it. So therefore, you can't completely put the screws, you know, to Turkey on all these other issues. Mm -hmm. um, we we uh, need to turn to the audience for Q's and A's, and uh, we're delighted to take uh, questions. That If you have one, please raise your hand, and my colleague back there will bring uh, the microphone <coughs> to you. <coughs> Uh, thank you for this uh, very insightful and nuanced uh, presentation. I'm Axel Chorlu. Um, I'm a historian, political scientist, uh, and many other things. I wear many hats. And the question that I'm going to ask is based on these many different hats. Um, I essentially agree with what uh, Henri was saying about the trans transactionalism, that how Erdogan is not exactly made to pay a price. Basically, he has gotten away with things that no other leader in Turkish history would have gotten away with over a uh, prolonged period of uh, time. But at the same time, as I think about all these higher level engagement things that we're talking about, you know, higher level actors, states, institutions, and so on, I also think about um, the other side of this. And that comes from both being a historian and so on, but also as a minority in Turkey, as a Greek Armenian Levantine in Turkey, um, <laughs> who has witnessed as well as studied the last hundred years. Uh, well, I haven't witnessed the last hundred years. Um, <laughs> but um, what enabled Erdogan, what made Erdogan, um, was part of that public. It's not as if Erdogan came out of nowhere. And it's not as if Erdogan created the Turkey that crushed its minorities, that destroyed a good chunk of its um, uh, you know, variety and, and multicultural uh, heritage and so on and so forth. He's just a different branch that you know, came up and destroyed the old social contract. If it was a social contract, it was a very limited social contract that I'm uh, mm -hmm. addressing about here. Um, because a social contract that's not inclusive, a social contract that's based on excluding large chunks of the society and crushing them is not quite the social contract that Renan wants to uh, talk about. So addressing these things at a top level, the transactionalism, you know, what can be done, and you know, how, how you can put pressure on Turkey and Erdogan, should it be principled, and so on, I, I think these are very valuable. Um, but what about the public that, ena that enab enables the, all these things? Erdogan draws power from these things. Um, there's a chicken and egg dynamic in that the more Erdogan drifts to the right, the more he utilizes anti-Semitic tropes, anti-Christian tropes, um, a whole variety of anti-Western tropes, and so on, the more you know, support he derives from good, ch good chunks of uh, Turkish society, um, and even uh, deriving support from society that does not vote for him. Mm -hmm. um, when uh, Henri gave the example of uh, what it used to be the uh, Turkish left that was the you know, anti-American element, uh, and now Erdogan has actually sort of become their leader in a sense as well, that that's, uh, speaks to that. Also a society that recently in the poll showed to be overwhelmingly anti-American, um, you know, seeing the US as a great enemy and so on and so forth. So. What do you think the role of um, public diplomacy is? How do we address the other side of this problem? Not the top level, but track two diplomacy, public diplomacy. How do we create a nuanced, multi-pronged approach to Turkish public? Because as, as the Turkish public drifts further and further, 
into this anti-Western, uh, anti, um, you know, anti-Semite, uh, anti-Christian, anti-minority position, Erdogan and his, uh, let's say, um, followers, whoever will follow Erdogan after he's gone, are going to continue using these dynamics. So how do we address it? Not just at the top level, but also addressing the Turkish public. Thank you. Sibel, do you want to take a crack at that one? That's a difficult one, but I fully agree with everything you've, you've said, Axel, including the idea that the social contract will have to have more colors than, than what it originally, you know, or, or, or what, what I, what I um, may have um, painted it with. So, so I fully agree. Um, I think it's very difficult to, to change hearts and minds because um, going back to what Ambassador Edelman said about uh, you know, anti-Americanism and, and, the, and the, the sort of the tense relationship between U.S. and Turkey was not a, a something of the last two decades, but, you know, there are instances in the past going all the way back to, um, uh, to the pogroms and the Johnson letter and, and all of that, including uh, sort of entrenching greater anti-Americanism, anti-Semitism, anti-Greek, um, uh, 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 anti-Greek tropes and, 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 and so on and so forth. So um, I think it's not something that can happen overnight. And I think it's going to take a, a generation, perhaps, to, to overcome um, these deeply entrenched um, fears and antipathies and, and, and these feelings of threat. Uh, and... Um, and it's, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm glad I'm not a public diplomacy uh, person because I think it's a very difficult thing to do, but I don't think it's going to happen overnight and, 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 and certainly we'll need decades and decades to, um, to rebuild that relationship and to rebuild perceptions. Sinan, did you want to? Um, so your neighbor who was sitting there, uh, Alan Murkowski, has just stepped out. Um, he, he and I were talking last night and he said, you know, there was a Pew Research poll that he saw back from the days of Turgut Azal uh, where Turkish notions of, of, of Judaism and Jews in Turkey was completely the, the opposite of what we're seeing now. And I saw a poll from Metropole that came out just today, actually, as Arsangelo is reporting just how much um, you know, public opinion is swayed. I agree with you. I think, you know, I, I agree with the premise of the basis of what you're saying historically. Uh, but I think elite manipulation of public sentiment is at the top of this. Mm -hmm. And I think it's going to take decades. I mean, if not, you know, I'd be, I'd be impressed if most of the people attending that pro-Hamas rally on Saturday could even place Jerusalem on a map. I mean, if they ask them, what, you know, what, what do they, what, you know, why are they protesting? I don't think they necessarily have an idea of essentially other than what they're going to be handed to them. Um, but I think, you know, the elite manipulation of that sentiment um, it, it, at this point is, is the central figure of this. I mean, just daily, you know, spewing of, of this and that. Um, in, in terms of publicly vilifying minorities. And, you know, Kurdish minority is obviously, you know, accustomed to this, decade on decade. Um, and so I agree with the basis that it was already pretty, you know, you know, entrenched there historically. But I don't think necessarily that was going to, you know, that could have been, could not have been overcome in the last 21 years of Erdogan governance. You know, if, if they really pursued the Europeanization track, if they really sort of tried to sort of, you know, um, have a more substantive relationship with the United States and its allies, which would have meant looking at Hamas by a government standard, if you, if you want a relationship of values and principles, then you look at this and say, Hamas is a terrorist organization and it should be condemned and we, we find it abhorrent. Instead, when you say the opposite and say Hamas is a group of Mujahideen, you get a sort of you know, or mindset that just sort of nods because they're being fed that through channels of media nonstop. Yeah, I mean, as someone who broke his pick on the public diplomacy uh, issue back in 2003 to 2005, I, I, I think the media environment in Turkey is extremely challenging, and, and it is way worse now than it was when I was, was, was there. Thank you. Aykan Erdemir, Anti-Defamation League. Uh, thank you for this great presentation. I have a question to Sibel about a potential uh, mismatch between political elites rhetoric and behavior and grassroots behavior. Mm. Uh, on the political elite side, I think messaging has been very clear, right? An AKP city councilor uh, recently stated, you know, he praised Hitler, he called for cleansing the world of Jews and destroying Israel, mm -hmm. and, he's, and, and no one in the city council opposed him, including the opposition, 
and he's still in office. Mm -hmm. Or Erdogan has openly endorsed Hamas, uh, called it, a, you know, as you said, a liberation group and Mujahideen. And Davutol in the opposition uh, glorified Hamas uh, violence uh, by sharing even footage of body cams and motorized paragliders. So the, the political elite behavior is clear. Mm -hmm. But then we also see the streets and get the assumption that the people must be with the political elite. Mm. But according to a Metropole survey carried uh, three to six days after the 10-7 mm -hmm. attacks, even within the AKP, among AKP voters, only 12% state that Turkey should support Hamas. Mm. Those who, who say support Palestinians but distance from Hamas, mm -hmm is only 24 more percent. So even within Erdogan's party, only 36 percent say support the Palestinian side, with or without Hamas. Mm. More than half of AKP voters, and this is even higher with other party members, say Turkey should either be a mediator or should remain neutral mm. in this conflict. So how do you explain the mismatch if this poll is accurate, and it mm. was a representative survey. Mm. If this poll is accurate, how do you explain the divergence between the political elite and the Turkish electorate? Mm -hmm. And also, how do you explain the mismatch between these um, spectacles of glorification of Hamas violence and right. terrorism on the streets, and what I see from this poll, the silent Turkish majority? Right. Thank you. That's a, that's a very um, good and tough question. So let me, let me try to take a stab at that. So um, I think Ozar Sanjar is, is leading Metropole, right? So, so I, I, I respect him. Obviously, he's, he's an expert in, in public opinion uh, polling in, in Turkey. But I wonder if the timing of this poll was, um, was critical in explaining that particular result that you're talking about. So if I'm understanding, if I listen to you correctly, it, you're basically saying that 36, only 36% of AKP supporters are interested in supporting Palestine um, and supporting Hamas and the, some combination of those two. Uh, but then the majority wants uh, Turkey to either play a mediator role or be neutral. I think that was, and this is like three to six days, you said, um, this was about the same time, if I can you know, reconstruct the timeline in my head, where, where a, Turkey did have this sort of floated this idea, and Erdogan did float this idea of potentially mediating this crisis between the two, um, uh, between the two sides. And I think had we read it, I don't know if there's a, there's a new poll coming out. I hope, I very much hope that Metropole does this poll again and asks the same question. I would bet that the, 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 the results would be much more different uh, in, uh, in favor of that 36%. I think I would see a lot more um, sort of increase on, on those who would say, you know, we should support Hamas and we should support, uh, support Palestinians. I think the timing and the, 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 the unexpectedness of, of, this, um, uh, of this attack uh, was um, was explain, could explain um, the sort of lackluster, the sort of un, uncertain support that that Palestinians and and, and Hamas and um, specifically would would be getting. Um, I will say the following: a, a, a couple of things that I hope will will also address Icon your your question. Um, political elites on across all parts of the spectrum. Uh, sympathize with the Palestinian cause and and the the lack of information or the lack of understanding of that story with with, with the Israeli Palestinian conflict I think easily spills over to supporting Hamas and 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 supporting anti-semitism and so I think there is you know regardless of what um, what Erdogan might say and what um, what Devutolu might say, which are basically cut from the same cloth, let's face it. Um, I think um, parties on the left, uh, nationalists, I think all sort of colors of the political, uh, political spectrum, um, if, if, if scratched long enough, will, 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 will show some kind of anti-Israel and, and, and pro-Palestine and particularly pro-Hamas sentiments. Um, and, and so uh, 
So I think there that kind of elite queuing is, is imperative, that people are shaping their decisions, the public is shaping its decisions and, and sort of opinions about, about the conflict based on what they hear from the elites. But also, and I agree with, with both Sinan and Ambassador Edelman in terms of how um, the vile rhetoric in the media is stoking these, um, uh, these, these attitudes further. Uh, and again, considering the, the, the most recent sort of um, types of news coverage that, that comes out of, of Turkish television channels and newspapers, um, considering all of that, I would assume that if we were to refield this exact survey now, I think the sentiments would be much more mm. um, in favor of supporting Hamas and, and, and um, sort of supporting Palestinian cause at the expense of Israel, right? There's that, there's that caveat that we should be cognizant of. I think it's okay to argue that, you know, Palestinians deserve to live um, in peace, uh, in prosperity and in safety along with Israel. I think it's okay to say that and I think we should say that. But saying that we support Palestine with the caveat that ex at the expense of Israel, I think that's where more people would fall in um, if we were to do this survey again. But, you know, I, I stand corrected. I think we have time for maybe just one more question because uh, we need to wrap up at 1230. So. Hi, uh, David Gregorian. I'm a senior fellow at Harvard's Kennedy School, ex-IMF economist. Uh, I suspect that part of the reason why we didn't hear much by way of policy prescriptions today is that there's still disagreements among panelists as to what Turkey is bringing to the table. I might be wrong. As I was listening to all the three of you, I was sort of picturing a stylized balance sheet of Turkey-West relationship, and there's a lot of things, items on the liability side, couldn't come up with anything. On the asset side, there are one or two examples. Um, so, and, and as, a, as a former crisis manager, I appreciate Ambassador Edelman's uh, um, parallel to too big to fail, and even there, there are solutions to, uh, mid, medium-term solutions to how to solve the big to fail, uh, too big to fail problem. So, what would be your prescriptions uh, for, uh, for Turkey, U.S. relations in particular? What would call um, Erdogan's bluffs in many of the situations. And, and by the way, to the negative deeds, I, I'd like to add the uh, Turkish uh, Turkish role in uh, uh, 2020 uh, Armenia-Azerbaijan war, uh, uh, supplying uh, not only special forces, but also uh, Islamic jihadists. Uh, thank you. Want to take it? Policy prescriptions, yeah. Ari, that's... <laughs> well, I, look, I think... Um, I think I may, I, I've made it uh, clear that I think we have to we have to essentially sit down with the Turks and basically say, the, if you want to improve relation, the relationship with the United States and if you want uh, to benefit from from a close relationship with the United States, meaning especially economically, uh, that you need you, you need to change your behavior. And if you don't. We have to explain to them that, as an as a member of the alliance, I'm this. I'm not talking about it in terms of punitive. I'm talking about establishing a new basis, right? Because everything after all these years, the the basis that we used to have has completely corroded. There is no no basis to to the relationship except that geopolitically it's important. We have bases there. We have interests there, and. We, we, we want to continue that, continue that relationship. And it's very clear that they do not have other options. They not, they, they, as I tried to explain earlier, because of what Turkey is economically, it doesn't have any other choice, right? So our, we have great cards in our, in our hands, and we have to explain to them. And we have to ask, him, ask Erdogan to change his rhetoric, and say to him that this is going to be the basis of, of our, uh, the future of our relationship. Look, at the moment, one of the things that really antagonizes him, or he's really angry at, is I think by the end of the Biden, first Biden administration, this is going to be the, probably the first time that a Turkish leader doesn't come for a state visit to, to Washington, right? Biden has been very good about that. You know, he's made it very clear. You're not coming to, 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 to the White House, right? And it's driving Erdogan crazy. But we have to explain to him, 
this is going to be the future of the relationship. Of course, <coughs> presidents change in the United States. We've had presidents who, who like uh, other who, who we know likes authoritarian leaders. So uh, how can how can you know talk about uh, a, a policy? But U.S. government has a strong bureaucracy that has to first of all agree within it itself as to what the policy is going to be. There is no agreement at the moment within within USG, and therefore. Uh, you have people all over the place on, on Turkey, and we have to have a conversation within the government first here as to what it is we want to achieve and how we're going to achieve. We're not getting what we want at the moment, and and my argument is, it goes back, you know, doing the same thing over and over again is, as Eric said, insanity, and that's what we're doing at the moment. Right? Give, so. Well, all I'm arguing is for least rethinking the relationship and establishing the baseline. Sinan? Um, excellent question. I would say, just based, based on the notion of practicality, I don't think any you know, pres policy prescriptions are not likely to succeed until Erdogan is out of the picture. I think there is no stone that hasn't been overturned. I don't think we can rebuild a substantive relationship, either on the basis of transactionalism or a more substantive principle thing. And when I say Erdogan being out of the picture, I mean, this is up to Turkey to remedy. They, they need to finally realize that Erdogan has to be voted out if that's possible. Um, short of that, I agree with Henri in terms of like, the United States government should take a leaf from Vladimir Putin's book, which is when a Turk shot down a jet in 2015, what did Putin do? He stuck it to Erdogan by punitive economic measures and diplomatic initiatives that resulted in Erdogan formally apologizing to Putin because Turkey's economy contracted by 0.5%. He <coughs> understands force and he responds to it if, if he can see that Turkey is negatively impacted by it beyond the point of his own even opinion. In the current environment, you know, if you look at the notion of, you know, for example, what should Turkey's position be towards Hamas, this is not a hard one for the United States to drill down. I think a letter emanated out of uh, uh, Congressman uh, Chris Pappas's office yesterday sent to the Secretary of State saying, here is what we, sh what we are asking of Turkey to do. Be consistent and hard on that. Revoking the passport of people like Ismail Haniya and Salih al Sururi should not be a heavy lift for this administration to ask of Turkey. This is low hanging fruit. These are terrorists. It's not hard to say, hey, Turkey, you know what? Get rid of their passports. That's not okay. Shut down their offices. Stop giving them media space. Stop allowing them to you know, shuttle back and forth between Iran. Stop providing raw materials if it is emanating from Turkey, either with your consent or with your tacit acceptance that ends up in the hands of Hamas, a rocket making material. That should not be hard, right? Another policy thing is, and you know, and this is how the, you know, the Turks shoot back at, uh, and, and it's been quite effective in Washington. And I think it's time that the United States government gets on top of this. The whole notion of the SDF. You know, Turkey's basically going around saying, Oh, you want us to stop uh, you know, you know, helping Hamas? Why don't you stop helping <coughs> Kurdish terrorists, quote unquote, in northern Syria, the SDF, the United, the United States' partners? Can we just get behind this notion? And the United States government should be vocal about this, saying the SDF are not terrorists, right? They've not made one single act threat or actual military engagement that has threatened the lives of Turkish citizens, nor do they have any intention of doing so. Um, they have been instrumental in fighting against the Islamic State and still containing it. By the way, a role which we offered to Turkey under the Obama administration, Erdogan walked away from it because he was so hell-bent on trying to overthrow Assad for God knows what reason, right? Um, but also, they are still the only ones there manning ISIS prisons, preventing thousands of ISIS jihadists flowing out into the region and and compromising the territorial integrity of our allies, such as Iraq, right? You know, to the extent that the United States just doesn't shoot back at this and say, enough, it's high time we move beyond this, get behind it. Counterterrorism means fight against ISIS. If you want to coordinate and collaborate in that by contributing troops towards that fight, as opposed to by, uh, backing Al Qaeda affiliated jihadis, we'd welcome that. I'm um, anything short of that, enough. This soft peddling of SDF are terrorists and you, you know, we just seem to sort of meander around this and I'm, I'm personally fed up. Uh, I'm fed up with my own government not actually taking a strong stance and saying, put an end to this, right? 
and Arnie's mentioned this to me before, when they mentioned that the United States backs, you know, tur Turkey's counterterrorism or sort of, you know, terrorist or security concerns, it was the United States government that explicitly helped the capture of Abdul Ojal and hand them to the Turks. Yep. Whether you agree with that or not. Why do they not say that? So right. it's just frustrating. But until Erdogan leaves, nothing changes. And Israel. Yeah, Israeli and American cooperation. Whether you agree with, with the outcome of that or not. But, you know. I think that's a perfect uh, point on which to end, Zinan. Thank you very much. I want uh, uh, to thank our panelists for a very stimulating discussion. I learned a lot, as I always do, from all of these folks. So thank you very much.